Hello ladies, welcome to another ladies Bible class. Today we're going to look at Mark chapter 7 verses 24 through 37. So we're going to pick up where we left off last week. So let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this account of the life of the Lord Jesus when he dwelt here on earth and how he interacted with people, how he met people where they were at and ministered to them directly. Lord, there's such good stuff in this account. Lord, I have nothing to offer except my brain, my body, and access to you. So Lord, I pray that you would just teach through me, fill me afresh with your spirit, that he would establish my thoughts and honor you in it, that we come away refreshed and encouraged from this time in the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Now last week we looked at his interaction with the Pharisees and how he was getting on their case about um, their hypocrisy and how they were really anal about keeping the outside clean but they weren't dealing with the real problem which was the heart the heart problem because out of the heart the mouth speaks and out of the heart comes all these things that defile a person these sinful choices these iniquities and transgressions and that's really the problem of mankind is the heart not whether their hands were washed before they ate the meal and so he is pointing the Pharisees to that and then more importantly he was pointing his disciples to understand that because remember the disciples were raised as good Jewish boys and even though they weren't washing their hands like a priest would or like one of the followers of those rabbis would they were still ingrained with and we see this later in the book of Acts still ingrained with the dietary laws and keeping kosher and things like that and and at this point of the account Mark tells us that you know, in saying these things, Jesus declared all foods clean. So in on, on the heels of that, Mark goes on to write about um, an account that happens when they get alone, when he's trying to get away from everybody. Verse 24, from there he, came, he arose and went to the region of Tyre. Now Tyre and Sidon, Tyre's below Sidon, they're coastal cities. Um, Tyre, for example, was written of in the book of Isaiah, I believe 14. The king of Tyre is a pseudonym for Satan himself from Lucifer from Nakash. And, and these are Canaanite territories. And remember, the Canaanites are going to worship a whole variety of deities, uh, false gods, that uh, would have claimed that region as their own. And see, these are coastal, they're upper Galilee, upper Galilee's inland. And then the coastal cities of Tyre and Siren, um, Sidon were known as the Syrophoenician area. And so this woman that we're going to encounter is clearly of Canaanite descent. She is not Jewish. So he went to that region, and, when he, and he enters a house. He didn't want anybody to know he was there. He wanted to be as, as covert as possible. He didn't want the crowds to gather. He just wanted to... Re prop you know what, he probably just needed a, an opportunity to relax and just have an intimate conversation with the people that were housing him. Uh, but he couldn't escape notice. And, and again, this boggles my mind that even in the day where there's no TV, no radio, no mass communication like that, there's no internet, the word has traveled so fast. The people are tracking him and then getting the word out. The teacher is here. The rabbi is here. Jesus is here. The healer is here. And even in this predominantly Syrophoenician Canaanite town, the word has traveled. After hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. And you think, oh my word, how did a little girl get possessed by a demon? Folks, there are a lot of ways that that can happen. And I don't really want to go off too far on the tra tangent about spiritual warfare and demonic entities and possession. But um, even in the description of, of that God gives of himself, that he is kind and compassionate and loving and and wanting to forgive looking for an excuse to forgive but but he will hold to account those who don't repent 
and he'll hold them accountable for, to the third and fourth generation of the iniquities of the fathers. I mean, that doesn't sound very nice. Actually, the nice thing, it only goes to the third and fourth generations. After that, the enemy has no legal standing and argument against it. And when we understand the legalities of the courtrooms of the heavenly realms, how the enemy is saying, look, this is my land, this is my territory, you deeded it to me, you gave it to me, and this again goes back to some texts in Deuteronomy 32 and, and uh, Psalm, yeah. golly, I can't, it's in the 80s, and I don't know which one it was, but it, it, it speaks of the divine council, it speaks of the dividing up of the nations, God kept Israel, the rest of the nations were divvied out to the lowercase g gods, the Elohim. He's like, you want to rule the earth? Okay, here you go. He divvies it out. And these entities, these fallen entities, watchers, were became the pantheon of the Greek, the Roman, the Norse pantheon. But they also were known in uh, this day and age by a variety of names, uh, one of which would have been uh, Baal, Baal's Ephon, um, uh, Ashtaroth, all these different pagan deities that we know, Molech, all of these were actually um, connected to the, the watchers and the fallen entities of, of Gen uh, Genesis chapter 6. So anyway, when a demonic entity is welcomed in, especially to somebody who uh, has not come to know Christ, and, and again, I need to keep it in context here, so this is pre-cross, and these people would engage in these pagan deities. They would often offer their children, not just in a, a, in a death sacrifice like to Molech, but they would dedicate their kid to Ashdod, to Ashtoreth, to Molech, to um, Baal. And as a result of doing this, in the heavenly realms, the enemy and his minions have a legal standing in the courtrooms to say, that kid belongs to me. And as a result of that, I'm going to take a place in, through the power of sin, in their mind, in their soul, and manipulate them and make their life a living hell. So that demon could have entered via the choices the parents made. That demon could have entered through a generational lineage of a parent worshiping one of these Canaanite deities. And again, the enemy would say, I have legal standing. I have every legal right to claim this kid as mine because of the sins and iniquities of the previous generations. And in the courtrooms of heaven, the Lord would say, you're right. And so they're allowed to continue this on earth. And I know that sounds odd, but we need to understand the legalities in the court systems of heaven as well as how it plays out here on earth. And the enemy is continually claiming these legal standings, legal rights. Uh, we see some of this go on in the book of Job in the two encounters where the enemy, Nakash, the adversary, comes in and makes a legal argument against Job. And God gives him certain parameters. He sticks to it. Satan's purpose or, or the adversary's purpose is not accomplished, but God's is in Job's life. But in this case, this little girl has been tormented by this demonic entity. And her mom has realized this isn't good. And she's heard of Jesus and she has come to understand that Jesus has authority over these demons and they're having to leave and because he is exercising this authority like no one else ever has then he must be who he says he is and he must be greater than and so she's going to interact with him in a very interesting way in a way that indicates faith so she comes, she falls at his feet. That falling to the feet, again, is a, a sign of submission, a sign of surrender and honor and respect. Now, the woman was a Gentile. Okay. Um, I'm just looking at a side note here. Some early manuscripts add that she was from Sidon or Syro Syrophoenician. Um, She's of the Syrophoenician race. So again, she's from the region of of Phoenicia, and that is in the Tyre and Sidon range. That means she has Canaanite background. Enemies of Israel, Baal worshipers. 
she kept asking him so she was repeatedly asking please 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 she's begging she's begging him to cast the demon out of her daughter we don't see the daughter she has just come on behalf of her daughter saying please just cast the demon out of my daughter just tell it to leave please she's begging 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 his answer to her has troubled a lot of people. I was praying to ask the Lord, give me some insight here. And he's saying to her, let the children be satisfied first. He came to the Jews first, then to the Gentiles. Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not proper to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now he's testing her. He's testing her. How does she see herself? Because to a Jew, a Gentile was tantamount to a dog. A dog was unclean. A dog you wouldn't have around. The Gentiles did, but you know, you just didn't keep dogs as pets back in Israel, okay? And they were tantamount to dogs. They were they were a disgusting animal to the Jews. And she answers and says to him, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. She's switching the view of the dog from being unclean to, Here's a family pet. Here's someone who has come under the authority, the covering, and the protection. This is, in essence, her saying to him, I submit to you. It is a declaration of faith and submission. She knows she needs grace and mercy. She doesn't go away. She doesn't, you know, give up. She persists. She begs. She begs. Why? Because she knows that Jesus has the authority to say the word and the demon would leave beloved the Lord never pushes away faith he wasn't pushing her away he was testing her do you believe do you believe I am who I am do you believe that I will have mercy on you we know in the Old Covenant, it talks about that he would be a light to the Gentiles. And so he wasn't intending ever to push her away. He was testing to see if she was going to persist and believe. And that persistence paid off. Because as he's testing her, she's allowed them to declare, look, I may be a dog, but I'm at your table. I am under the table, okay? I understand I'm not worthy to sit at the table. I don't care. I don't need to sit at the table. I just let me clean up the crumbs. I'm here under your authority, in your house, under your protection. I need you to feed me. I need you to be my life. I need you to throw me some crumbs, just like you would a pet, someone in your family. How many of you have dogs? I have friends that have dogs. My sister has dogs. They eat, from the, they eat the scraps. They sit there looking at you, just waiting for you to hand them something. But they're loved. They're not treated on par with, well, some of them are probably treated better than family. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. I'm saying that she's like, look, I want to be part of your family, even if I have to be the, the dog under the table. And I know that you'll have mercy and you'll throw the crumbs. The kids crumbs, kids are going to throw crumbs to the dogs. Please just give me some crumbs. And so he looks at her and says to her, Because of this answer, because of your word, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Her statement was, I choose to be under you. And as a result, the enemy lost his legal standing and had to leave, okay? I want you to think of this whole thing as in terms of um, a squatter or a renter. 
And for the person in this kid's case, the, the lease was signed by probably a, um, a family member on her behalf. She didn't necessarily always just welcome the demon, and she may have, but in most cases it's, this is a generational passage. And so the mother, again, is coming as the representative, as the authority over the daughter, and she's representing in the legal courts before the righteous judge, which is Jesus, and seeking this eviction. And the enemy said, hey, I have legal standing to stay here. We know with COVID that those that rent have incredible standing in the court system. In fact, it is, in the state of Pennsylvania at least, it's illegal to evict anyone at this point. And if they haven't paid their rent or any of that, for whatever reason, you cannot evict someone because of, of COVID, which makes it really tough on the landlords who um, aren't getting their rent paid to them and they're, you know, really suffering here. In the same idea, you know, we need to evict the enemy and those of us that are in Christ, we have the authority to confess, renounce, reclaim the legal standing, pour the, plead the blood of the Lamb over it and declare that in the heavenly realms on, that it might be on earth as it is in heaven and get that freedom. And that's what happened for this, this girl. Now again, this is pre-cross, but still Jesus' authority hasn't changed. He's said it. He's made it so. She's declared her faith, come under his authority. And so he says the word, and the demon left the girl. And it's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to see. Going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, and the demon had departed. So we don't know how this demon would manifest in this daughter, in this account, we're not told. We're not told, but she could tell that that demon had left. And it was told to her that it happened in synchronization with what Jesus had said. So I guarantee you she has gone and told others. And now this is spreading, not just in the Jewish community, but it's starting to be that light to the Gentiles. So the next account we have, and again, he went out from the region of Tyre, so he's left the coast, at least Tyre, and he came through Sidon. So he's heading north along the coast. He goes from Tyre through Sidon back over to the Sea of Galilee, to the region of Decapolis, the ten cities, ten towns is what uh, we know from there. And they brought him one who was deaf and who could barely speak, and a deaf mute but he had great difficulty, perhaps a, a, a tongue that wasn't properly attached or whatever. There's, there's any variety of reasons that could um, result in, the, in a speech impediment. And they entreated him to lay his hands upon them. And let me just get this. Okay, we're back toward, we're in Decapolis. Okay, that means the ten cities or towns. Ah, sorry. Okay, so we have this deaf slash mute or slash speech impediment. And I want you to recall, too, what... Um, when John had sent word to Jesus, when he was really struggling, he'd been in prison with Herod, his disciples came and, and they wanted to test Jesus. And they said, look, is it re are you really the Messiah? And Jesus points to the miracles and the lame walk, the blind see, and the deaf hear. So this is one of those accounts that is so critical that he is doing what these, what Messiah was, told to do in, in Isaiah and other accounts of the prophetic word in the Old Covenant in the prophets. And so he is, again, exemplifying his messianic powers and his unique powers to be able to heal the, the deaf and those who can't speak. So this is a big deal, but I want you to pay attention to how intimate this, this healing is. When you watch Jesus in the Gospels, in these accounts, you're going to see him deal 
with people very uniquely. He rarely heals someone the same way. Because it isn't about the technique, it's about the faith. It's about his power coupled with the person's faith. They were entreating him to lay his hand upon him. So they were, just touch him, just touch him, just touch him. Well, he does more than that. Okay, most people were thinking, you know, just touch. Because there were times when Jesus would walk through and people would just touch and they, the power would go out. And, you know, again, the power is released of the Lord by our faith. When we put our faith in him, it's not just, ooh, maybe he'll heal me. It's, I know if I'll touch him, he'll heal me. The, the woman with the flow for all those many years, if I just touch his garment, I'll be healed. That faith was demonstrated, and he pointed her out, and he said, look, your faith has healed you, coupled with his power. So he takes this, this person aside from the multitude. So he singles him out by himself. He gets him alone. He's not doing this for show. This isn't a Benny Hinn healing showcase. It is a Jesus, I want to connect with you. I want you to know that I love you. Again, remember that those that were born deaf, blind, mute, it was determined by the Pharisees that they were steeped in sin. Rotten to the core. Okay, this is a discussion that will happen. I don't remember which gospel records this one where uh, he's asked the question, you know, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because it was taught that that person was steeped in sin. You're so rotten. Your genealogy, your lineage is so bad that you're cursed with this birth defect because of that. And so I guarantee you this guy hasn't been allowed in synagogue if he is a Jew. Um, he hasn't been allowed to be around people. He's be considered unclean. And that on top of having the inability to hear or to effectively communicate. This is what he's been through his whole life. So Jesus pulls him aside and has an intimate, an intimate interaction with him. He's not afraid to touch him. He's not afraid to interact with him. He's not casting him out. He's not shaming him. How many times have people poured shame into one another because they don't measure up to our standard? Jesus does nothing like that. He pulls him aside. He puts his fingers into his ears. And then he spits. He takes some of that spit and touches the man's tongue. Was there magic in his saliva? I don't know. He did what he knew the man needed. He put his fingers in his ears. He took some spittle, put it on the man's tongue. Why? I don't know. Jesus knows. It's what he chose to do. He did it because that's what the man needed. And he looked up to heaven. He takes a deep breath. And he says to him, Ephatha, be open. Be opened. He said the word. I don't know that sticking his fingers in his ears or the spit did anything to heal him. What it did was somehow encourage the man that this guy's not afraid to touch me. It's an intimate act. He shared spit with him. That is a commingling. When, when they dipped bread, you see this in the Last Supper, when they dipped bread in the cup, they considered that a commingling, a very intimate act. You only did that with the people you loved the most and trusted the most. Because you're swapping spit. In essence, kissing, in essence, in the swapping of spit. He swapped spit with this guy. I'm commingling with you. I love you. I am within you. I am your life. What a beautiful act he did. But that, that isn't what opened his ears and mouth. It's what this guy needed to be healed within far deeper. That I love you. I am commingled with you. 
I am not ashamed of you. What a beautiful act that the Lord did. What a beautiful act. And that deep breath and that be open, the command. He said the word. And the man received his hearing. The ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was removed. And he began to speak plainly. He did not need speech therapy. He didn't have to learn to talk. He immediately spoke very clearly. I, I, I mean, I can't even imagine what that guy was feeling. You know, Jesus said the word. Now, ears and tongue healed. Again, a demonstration of his authority. But do you see the intimacy and the healing of the shame? He pulls him aside and has an intimate, loving interaction with him. He wasn't just healing the ears and the tongue. He was healing the man's heart and soul. That's what we all need, beloved. Healing deep within. Now he gave strict orders not to tell anyone. But here was what happened. The more he ordered them that, the more widely they continued to proclaim it. Look, power sin took an opportunity. Don't do that. Boom. Sin says, I'm going to do it. But it wasn't just that. I guarantee you the enemy was on them through the power of sin saying, how can I keep this to myself? How can I not tell them? Because again, they, they didn't have hospitals. They didn't have much hope for a lot of their physical conditions. They certainly didn't have any hope for the demonic issues. Jesus was the only answer. And so they weren't afraid to tell people about him. They weren't understanding the bigger picture that they needed a savior from sin. They were saying, dude, you've got an illness. You need to go see this guy. I know a guy. I know a doctor. I know who can fix you up. You need to go see Jesus. Just see Jesus and he'll take care of you. So it was making it very difficult for him to, to move around. But everybody was utterly astonished saying he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. So again, he is just encountering these people who are amazed at him. He does all things well. Do you see the high esteem he's held at this point? They're recognizing that he is making the, the deaf hear and the dumb speak in addition to the lame walk and casting out the demons. They're seeing all this. And community after community on hearing the reports are trying to decide who is this guy? Who is this guy? And at this point they're saying, we don't know who he is, but we like what he's doing. We like what he's doing. His reputation is really high at this point among the regular people, not necessarily among the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, but it's way high among the people that are in real need, the sheep without a shepherd. They're beginning to flock to him literally as, as sheep lost and in need of healing. And the shepherd is just has compassion upon them. And these accounts, these beautiful accounts, this intimate interaction, even for a Gentile woman, and even for one who would have been considered steeped in sin and unclean from birth. What a beautiful Savior we serve and how he wants to have that intimacy with us, how he would never push away, push us away or treat us with shame. He wants us to come to him. He's come to bind up the brokenhearted folks. And I encourage you, if you're struggling with anything, just come to the Lord. Ask Him to search you. Ask Him to sort out the emotions. Ask Him to meet you in your hurt. And He will. He will. And we're here to help you with that too. So reach out to me or if you want to learn more about our program, Journey Tools, I'd love to share that with you. 
I know some of you who are watching this have been through it, have been blessed by it, and received a lot of healing from it. So encourage your friends to check it out. But our Savior's amazing. He's so amazing. I hope and pray that this week you even draw closer to a, a deeper intimacy with Him as He brings he healing even deeper, deeper in your life. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, again, I thank you for this account. I thank you that you didn't turn away the, the Syrophoenician woman. I thank you that her faith was evident. And then as a result, the enemy was driven out. I thank you for the intimate way you touched this man without hearing and without speech, how you ministered to him, how you took away his shame, how you loosed his tongue, and he was immediately able to speak. Thank you for your compassion. You are the same God. You have the same compassion towards, toward us even now. So Lord, I pray that, that all of us who may still struggle with any kind of woundedness, that we would come to you for healing, come to you for intimacy, know that you're not gonna cast us out. Lord, strengthen our faith, guide us into your grace, all for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies. I hope you have a blessed week in Jesus. We'll see you next time.